Yeah, the loudness wars. I don't know that that's a that's something that ever actually ends. That that began, you know, with the loudness wars of uh, vinyl forty fives and jukeboxes, and then it moved into digital loudness wars. And I'm sure there's another frontier of loudness wars that we're that we could potentially be entering in now. So I don't know if that'll ever end. But the role of a mastering engineer uh, has evolved and continues to evolve. I think right now we're in a moment where uh, there's a lot of projects where, uh, because digital music creation tools have become so democratized, there's projects that can go from the beginning to very late in the stage where there's not a professional involved at all. Uh, and that's not the way that things used to be. Uh, so mastering engineers used to be able to sort of count on a certain amount of oversight of a project before it walked in the door. And uh, now our role is not only to be mastering engineers, which, you know, ob objective third-party listeners uh, with the tools to uh, correct anything that we need to, sweeten anything that needs sweetening, prepare for the formats and, you know, finish the last 10% of the project. That's classically what the role has been. But we're also uh, becoming increasingly sort of educators and coaches sometimes for our clients um, who, you know, don't have the benefit of, of maybe working with professionals in prior stages of, of the process historically like they would have been. Uh, that's that's something that's different than it used to be. I think the trend, too, is like um, programs that claim to master your whole project, you know. Um, sometimes on an iPad, right? It's like um, basically like you just, it's just something that you run um, like a spell checker and it just like masters your record. I think these are, this is the kind of the trend that is, of course, very attractive to people because it's, they, they're advertised for so cheap. And they're probably occasionally useful for things like, like maybe you're doing a podcast or, you know, you're writing music for your high school's play or something like that. Or, or I don't know, maybe just, Mastering some demos, you know, you have tons and tons of demos you want to put up like on a SoundCloud page, but it's like for for doing real records, I think these are maybe not the best, uh, not the best tools because I know I can say this, I'm sure it's probably the same for these guys, but I mean, I've actually gotten work remastering records that were done using those mastering programs um so it you know so that that's definitely a trend it's certainly not a trend that's threatening but it's um but you know it, it has a place so that's kind of a, that's kind of a new thing and uh and those programs definitely do play the loudness wars i mean they they like they really they mash stuff more than humans can mash stuff sometimes so i also think that obviously the trend i, I wouldn't call it a trend anymore i really because it's kind of gone beyond that. I um, mean, vinyl kind of made a serious resurgence and we're in the past where pe people were making DDPs for CD and so forth and so on. It's like now it's like you're preparing for vinyl and like all these bands that have no idea what vinyl is or how to format for vinyl are learning that like, okay, yeah, my sides have to be shorter, so I have to sequence things differently. I have to edit things differently. Um, I have to think ahead for vinyl. Um, and, uh, and I think also, with, uh, with, as far as the Loudness Wars is concerned, um, I feel like maybe the war has been won a little bit because, because of vinyl. Um, there is a bit of a return to dynamics because really loud ma masters don't cut really well directly to vinyl. Um, so, um, yeah, I feel like it's, it's, it, it is a really interesting time now. It's, uh, cause you know, vinyl is constantly like on the, on the uptick and, uh, um, at the same time, it's like, there's, there aren't that many people who have the expertise and the machinery as, as Adam and Josh to, to cut and the pressing plants are still not, you know, they're getting better. You know, we, we were just talking to Mandy Parnell about, you know, the QCing um, and how it's really not that great. Um, test presses come back with a lot of issues. Um, so it's kind of like a slowly a beast kind of 
you know, trying to make its way through and, and f turn into something, you know, a little bit more beautiful. Um, if, you know, kind of a terrible analogy, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely an interesting time. Yeah. Vinyl mastering is just, is really tricky because you have a much smaller target to hit in a way to produce something that sounds good. There are, you know, some pretty serious limitations with vinyl which don't exist for other formats. Um, and a lot of people don't know what they are. So that's why we spend a lot of our time um, talking with bands and labels and, and artists about some of the traps for doing vinyl. And um, some of the biggest problems, I'd say the two biggest problems are really um, length, because the volume, the overall volume of your record is really determined by the length of the side. So basically shorter is louder and longer is quieter. And no one likes a quiet record really. So, so that's something to, to know, um, which most people don't know. And then the other thing is distortion. Um, and that is due to the fact that on a record, the sound quality is not the same over the course of the whole side. It's actually the best towards the outer diameter, and it gets worse as you go to the inside. It actually gets a lot worse, like the last inch of the record. So that last inch is kind of the danger area. So it's really, um, it's really critical. You have to think really carefully about what um, songs you put in that area, because the distortion can really, really go up. It's basically a bunch of different kinds of distortion all building up at one time. So, um, you know, you, n you don't really have to care about this in any other medium, you know, it's like, it doesn't happen on open reel tape. It doesn't happen in, on CDs, you know, like no one's, you know, iTunes playlist gets more distorted towards the, you know, towards the end of the playlist. Um, and it's a big, big deal. I mean, records can sound potentially really terrible if you don't take those things um, into consideration. So it's, it's, uh, so as long as you have a chance to, um, to talk to people about those, uh, traps, you know, bef before you start doing the project, like you'll get a much better sounding record out of it. Like if, if they know what the problems are, then you can go around those problems and hopefully, yeah, avoid them. Yeah. I think, uh, obviously everything that that Josh said is is true and relevant, and the you know the vinyl's limitations are part of what makes it special, right? So uh, it's the only consumer playback medium where, as a mastering engineer, I literally have twelve inches to fit the music, at, you know, in a physical domain. So this is different from everything else, and there are there are uh, there are consequences to decisions made in production that, you know, in iTunes are completely irrelevant as, uh, to whether or not something sounds good in iTunes. But on vinyl, they can make the difference between a, a record that's noisy and a record that's not noisy. And taking all that into account is special. There's nothing else like that. And, you know, part of what makes vinyl special, you know, the, the you, you had mentioned nostalgia in your question. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's nostalgia because a lot of the people, most of the people buying vinyl records now are too young to be nostalgic about it. What it is, I think, is wanting to engage with something in a, you know, in a, in a more direct way, right? Uh, convenient music is ubiquitous, so it sort of just fades into the background, right? But, but vinyl is a little inconvenient. It demands that you listen to it in one way. You have to put it on this special player, sit down and listen to a side. And it turns out that sitting down and listening to music actively about 20 minutes at a time is something that people really enjoy. Uh, so it's not a nostalgia thing. It's just the, the fact that this is a physical artifact. And part of you engaging with the music is dealing with the fact that it's a physical artifact. Now that's a boon, but it also comes at the cost of having to fit everything onto this physical artifact. And just to add one more thing like um, that's got nothing to do with sound quality is that um, I think, you know, vinyl is special because um, unlike every other physical format, it's it's kind of the only format that's that's kind of risen to the level of being an art object. 
you know? So, um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of people who play music are also visual artists, you know? So, um, and vinyl's a much bigger package and a lot of visual artists like that. And a lot of people will constantly mention, you know, like, see like cover art the first time that they saw a record like on the wall at the store like the cover art was striking and it's like this big it's almost like opening a book too right like when you open a gatefold lp there's all this information and so and there, you know there's people who collect records who don't even listen to them you know they're just kind of like they collect them as art objects and so you know that's not really a small thing and it it goes along with the philosophy that um you know that that music Music isn't just sound. You know, the culture of music isn't just sound. It includes the the visual and the physical component to it. And I think people like that the most um, about vinyl. That it they don't. It's not really the same in in um, any other format. Like CDs never really rose to that. You know, they they were kind of always. I mean, I think CDs got a bad rap. They can sound really good, but most people kind of thought. You know, at the end of the day, they were kind of just crappy pieces of plastic, you know, and a lot of people hated CDs. Um, so that part has nothing to do with the sound quality of vinyl. It's really just a cultural reason that people like records. Well, and think. also the experience, like it's the only thing we have left where you can go to the record store, you can flip through, you have a Sunday off, you get a coffee, you flip through records, you meet your friends, you talk to the record store uh, person. There's a culture, there's a, something really beautiful about it, and then you go home and you unwrap it and you look through the credits, you know, it's the last thing we have left where we have credits. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's beyond nostalgia, I, I would like to think so. It's, it's, it's yeah, connecting in that way. So, two parts to the answer. The first is that even though they've stopped licensing and developing the technology that that format will continue to exist obviously for for a long time it's not like people's mp3s are going to explode in their iphones right now but that would be cool that would actually i mean <laughs> i'd that, be happy about that. can we ask them if that's possible <laughs> uh self-destruct your phone <laughs> uh but uh i think you know the M mp3s were were you know a, a, as practical a solution to a problem as they could have served, you know, could have conceived at the time, which was how can we get something that sounds, I don't know, semi decent to be able to translate when translate across uh, tr or be transmitted across vast distances when bandwidth was very limited. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, I, uh, maybe a lot of people don't remember the, you know, the 14 4 baud AOL days, but I definitely do. <laughs> and now with bandwidth being, so big, there's really no reason, there's no technical reason to not just have audio fill a lot of that pipe. Uh, you know, I, uh, Heba mentioned Tidal Hi-Fi, uh, and I don't want this to turn into a commercial for Tidal Hi-Fi, but they're, <laughs> they're, they're streaming, you know, 2496. Yeah. That's a lot of information, and it doesn't shut down my internet connection when it's doing it. So uh, the, the, the technical, uh, considerations, the practical considerations that had to be made to just get you some kind of music over the internet, something that sounds generally like the music, don't exist anymore. So moving forward, uh, the, the, the opportunity is definitely there to, to lean more on quality and lean more on, on having an engaging and true to source experience. And uh, I think uh, there's lots of people who are fans of music that are excited about that. Yeah. It's kind of amazing that it stuck around as long as it did, but it became it became like a, you know culturally a format that people knew just as much as any other format. So it was yeah, it was supposed to be because of bandwidth limitations. It's supposed to be this really convenient kind of musical McNugget that you could just shoot you know to your friend or something. It was very easy and small, small file size. And now that it's no big deal to stream waves and bigger files it's it shouldn't be a big deal but you know maybe you could might be able to view this as tragic but you know like a lot of people have their entire record collections as mp3s right so um so there's a lot of, there's a lot of mp3s out there and they're not going to go away until people's hard drives fail which they seem to do to regular 
at a regular pace. I've noticed like every five or six years, most people I know kind of just lose all their music and all their photos. And it's because their laptops die. Yeah. And they just have to start over. Or they've been kind of a good librarian, you know, digitally, and they've transferred, they've copied some of the stuff to another hard drive. So they might survive another four years. And then, but they don't make the second migration. And that hard drive fails. And then they have to start all over. So, um, yeah, so MP3 is really kind of a just a temporary stopgap that's stuck around for a, a very long, really time. long time. Yeah, yeah like 20, 20 years so far, something like that, yeah. more. I don't know. But um, I do wonder if maybe Dr. Fraunhofer is, is he perhaps a little bit sad that that's like the, the most famous thing that he's, that he's known for is the MP3, which has received so much criticism in a way. I don't know. It's obviously really, he's a, he's a very smart guy. Smart Institute. So 